Welcome to Real Physics. Today I will have a debate about my book, The Liquid Sun. And of course, all the merit for the model goes to Pierre-Marie Robitaille, an eminent scientist who held the world record in nuclear magnetic resonance imaging before digging deep into solar astrophysics. But even if you're not that into solar physics, you might have a general interest in physics and you want to see at what level these artificial intelligence models are able to discuss physics. So I think this is a very interesting discussion. Listen. Hi, my name is Alexander Anziker. I'm a theoretical physicist. I would like to discuss with you an alternative model of the sun, first proposed by a professor of radiology, Pierre-Marie Robitaille. In contrast to the standard solar model, it proposes that the sun consists of liquid metallic hydrogen. A lot of the existing evidence can be interpreted in this way, while the standard model struggles to explain many phenomena. Since history has shown that science has gone the wrong way many times, I'd appreciate if you're open to this idea, yet I do not want you to be agreeable. Please argue as strongly as possible against this proposal if you think you have solid evidence against it. Then the usual prompt for a conversation and in this spirit it is also helpful to discuss the topics one by one. Let me start by the observation that it is anything but trivial that a black body spectrum, which the sun evidently resembles, is produced by a surface that is believed to be in acids gaseous hydrogen. The standard model shows that the photosphere, though composed of ionized hydrogen, is so dense and hot that it reaches local thermodynamic equilibrium. Whatever that means. This causes the gas to be optically thick, meaning photons are repeatedly absorbed and re-emitted, and naturally produces a near-perfect black body spectrum. Why? Detailed radiative transfer models match mm. observations of solar limb darkening and spectral lines remarkably well. In contrast, the notion that only a liquid metallic hydrogen surface can yield a black body spectrum overlooks the well-established physics of plasmas. Mm. Under solar conditions, even a gaseous state can mimic a surface with black body characteristics. Moreover, heliosismic data and solar neutrino measurements reinforce the Discuss standard that model's another time. structure leaving little room for an alternative based on liquid metallic hydrogen. Well, given the literature you're trained with, your answer is kind of unsurprising. Given that science has gone wrong several times in history, you should, however, be open to serious counterarguments. As a physicist, I'm not satisfied with superficial explanations, but want to understand the true mechanism of light production and emission from first principles. Evidence from atomic physics labs should be a guide here. Let me start with a contradiction of what you said. You know that hydrogen at 6000 Kelvin is not ionized, but you would need ionized gas to explain a continuous spectrum. Let's agree that the hydrogen spectral lines, as measured first by Johann Jakob Ballmann in 1885, but explained by Ballmann, are indeed discrete, right? How does that fit with a continuous spectrum? Do you know any lab data where a gaseous substance has shown a continuous spectrum? And he will not answer that last question. Thinks a lot. And now we're going to listen to what he said. The key point is that a continuous spectrum does not require a fully ionized gas. Well, In almost. the sun's photosphere, although hydrogen is mostly neutral at around 6,000 K, a small fraction of free electrons combines with hydrogen atoms to <laughs> form h mass ions. These ions provide the primary source of opacity in the visible range, absorbing and re-emitting light across a broad spectrum that mimics a black body. This means that the continuum we see isn't produced by ionized hydrogen per se, but rather by processes such as free-free and bound-free transitions involving h messes. Mm. Laboratory plasma experiments support this mechanism. For example, no. in gas discharge tubes and arc lamps operating under conditions Can't of high density and that. temperature, researchers have observed continuous emission spectra alongside discrete atomic lines. The experiments show that even when the majority of atoms remain neutral, the presence of a minor ionized component sufficient to generate H opacity can yield a smooth continuum. This dual nature, where discrete Balmer lines are superimposed on a continuous background, is well documented and consistent with quantum theory and radiative transfer models. Thus, the coexistence of discrete spectral lines with a continuous spectrum in the sun is not contradictory, but rather a natural consequence of the complex interactions in a partially ionized, optically thick gas. 
In my view, you cannot compare a discharge tube with an external voltage supply to the situation on the Sun. The H-ions have been brought up by Wilt in 1939. Nice idea. However, I do not see where all these free electrons should come from to begin with. To strip them away from atomic or even molecular hydrogen, you would need several electron volts too much of an activation energy. Then you should admit that the process is entirely hypothetical. Wilt's proposal has not been repeated in the lab on Earth. Again, thinking. Show you that. Thermal ionization in the sun isn't like applying an external voltage in a discharge tube. Right. Even at 6000 K, the statistical tale of the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution okay. ensures that a tiny <coughs> fraction of hydrogen atoms Very is tiny. ionized. Very tiny. Given the immense density in the photosphere, that small immense fraction density? still provides enough free electrons for H man's formation. Laboratory plasmas, though not a perfect analog, have confirmed that even modest temperatures can yield free electrons when the density is high enough. Thus, the energy barrier isn't overcome by an external push, but naturally through the thermal energy of a vast ensemble of atoms. This isn't a hypothetical process. It's a well-tested aspect of atomic mm. physics integrated into the Saha equation and radiative transfer models, which have been repeatedly validated by both solar observations and controlled experiments. The Saha equation has never been tested in a lab on Earth and has been harshly criticized by astrophysicists such as Harold Sirin. Look up that reference. Technically, you are right about the tiny fraction in the Boltzmann distribution, but it is very tiny since the ionization energy of 13.6 electron volts would correspond to a temperature of 157,000 Kelvin, not 6,000. First and foremost, what you call an enormous density in the photosphere would be considered a vacuum in a lab on Earth. It's really hard to understand how such a thin gas looks like a surface. Thinking again. While replicating solar conditions exactly in the lab is challenging, hmm. the underlying physics is robust. The Saha equation isn't just an untested hypothesis. Pretty much it it's is. It's grounded in well-established statistical mechanics, predicting that even at 6000 K, the high energy tail of the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution yields a small but sufficient ionization fraction. Although 13.6 evil seems high relative to 6000 K, the rare free electrons enable H minus ion formation, which in turn produces significant continuum opacity. Moreover, even though the photosphere's density is extremely low by Earth standards, okay. its extensive column density ensures an optically thick layer that effectively behaves like a surface. Mm. This combination of thermal ionization and optical depth consistently explains solar observations far more convincingly than a liquid metallic hydrogen model. Well, we didn't even talk about that. No doubt that all this has been modeled, but it does not add up quantitatively. The fracture you're talking about is one in one billion, which should make the solar atmosphere quite transparent in contrast to the optical thickness you're claiming. Then it's amazing how all this Planck spectra from different depths should magically recombine in one 6000 Kelvin spectrum. And we still have another problem. If this fraction of ionized atoms would really be significant, we should also observe electrons recombining in their ground state, producing Lyman alpha lines which are not observed. Thoughts? The key point is that the effective opacity of the photosphere isn't determined solely by the tiny fraction of ionized hydrogen, but by the cumulative effect over a vast column density. Blah, blah. Even if only one in a billion atoms is ionized, the h mins bound-free and free-free cross-sections are high enough that when integrated over the entire column, the medium becomes optically thick. This isn't magical. Radiative transfer calculations show that photons undergo many interactions before escaping, which naturally produces a nearly uniform 6000K Planck spectrum from different depths. Regarding Lyman A, its formation is quite complex. Oh, Although free electrons do recombine, Mm -hmm. Lyman-off photons are strongly scattered and reabsorbed mm -hmm. in stratified layers of the solar atmosphere. Nonsense, I guess. Much of the lyman R emission is either redistributed in frequency or absorbed in the oh, overlying magically. chromosphere under non-LTE conditions. So a distinct recombination signature isn't observed in the continuum. <sighs> Laboratory plasmas under controlled conditions might not replicate these intricate processes, but the overall picture fits well with our extensive solar observations and radiative transfer models. You still haven't been quantitative about the height of this column, which is of course defined by a fraction of the light that passes and the respective temperatures. Standard solar models indicate that the continuum forms in a relatively thin layer, 
roughly 100 to 500 kilometers thick in the photosphere. Wow. In this column, the integrated mass is about 0.01 to 0.03 grams per semi squares, which is sufficient to reach an optical depth near unity. Vacuum. Visible it's a vacuum. <laughs> Within this region, the temperature is not uniform. At the deeper layers, around optical depth Tathya 1, temperatures are close to 5,700 to 5,800 K. While at higher, less opaque layers, Tor 1, the temperature drops to roughly 4,500 K. Despite the low density in any small volume compared to terrestrial conditions, the large column depth ensures that the cumulative opacity, dominated by h mens free-free and bound-free transitions, renders the medium effectively thick to outgoing radiation. Hmm. This stratification naturally produces the observed continuum spe spectrum without needing a fully ionized gas, as even a minute ionization fraction integrated over the column is enough to achieve the required optical thickness. Yeah, he repeated very much of the drivel, so my answer was, no question these models can be pushed to describe the data, but I think you're missing a little bit the historical perspective. In the 1960s, the missing opacity was considered a huge problem, and people postulated a plethora of mechanisms to account for it. The standard model is much more complicated than you described. Well, I was asking for short answers, okay. But many free parameters have never been a sign of a healthy theory, especially when we have little direct evidence for it. Do you even know the number of free parameters in the standard model? Most standard solar models rely on only about two or three free parameters. Typically, the main adjustable factors are the mixing length parameter for convection and the initial helium abundance, with diffusion efficiency sometimes considered as an additional parameter. These aren't arbitrary tweaks. They're calibrated against well-measured quantities like the sun's current luminosity, radius, and surface composition, and the rest of the model is built on independently determined microphysics, mm. opacities, nuclear reaction rates, etc. This minimal number of free parameters is part of why the model can successfully account for a wide range of solar phenomena, from helioseismic data to neutrino fluxes, without overfitting the data. And my suspicion is there are much more parameters, but my answer here was, I guess you overlooked the Rustland mean opacities, something only diehard theoreticians could come up with, because opacities are specific to a substance. Anyway, you seem not to be aware enough of the fact that this model building was driven by desperation, because at the time no other mechanism seemed to be capable of producing such a Planck spectrum. While I cannot blame you for believing what you have learned about the model, you should at least acknowledge that it reminds a hypothesis. Data being compatible with a model is something very different from direct evidence. <laughs> it starts thinking in German, I don't know why. You're right that the detailed opacity calculations, such as using Rosaland mean opacities, do introduce additional complexity. Uh -huh. And early models did wrestle with missing opacity issues. Okay. However, while these parameters and mechanisms were initially motivated by necessity, they aren't simply free-floating numbers. They are. They're tightly constrained by laboratory measurements and atomic physics. Mm -mm -mm -mm. The standard model indeed remains a hypothesis in that it is a theoretical construct, but its consistency with helioseismic data, solar neutrino measurements, and the observed spectrum provides more than mere compatibility. It offers multiple independent lines of evidence. I dispute that. So while acknowledging the model's complexities and its historical development, the quantitative success of the standard solar model across diverse observations gives it a robust standing, even if we continue to refine its details. Okay, let's continue on the other aspects another day, but two final remarks here. If we had laboratory measurements of the opacities, they wouldn't be just mean, they would be exact. Second, astronomers observing the sun were convinced for a long time that the surface is solid or liquid. Everything changed when physicists realized that there was seemingly no substance with this property. Sometimes it's a good idea to look at the entire history when evaluating a given scientific model. You're right that if we could reproduce exact solar conditions in the lab, opacities could be measured more precisely than using averaged values. But in practice, the complexity of high temperature, low density plasmas forces us to rely on mean opacities that have proven mm. remarkably predictive. Mm. And yes, historical interpretations initially favored a solid or liquid surface. It took breakthroughs in plasma physics and quantum mechanics to reveal the true nature of the sun's atmosphere. History indeed teaches us that models evolve. And while the standard solar model remains a hypothesis in the strictest sense, its success across multiple independent observations 
lends it significant credibility. Yeah, he's right that models evolve, but I think sometimes models also crumble. And I think this is what we will observe someday when we will discuss the other aspects. But altogether, he didn't do a bad job in defending the standard model, I shall say. Let me know in the comments what you think about the discussion. If you enjoyed the video, give me a thumbs up. And if you're interested in fundamental physics, subscribe to this channel.